Germany awaiting trial in the Nuremberg war crimes trial. And uh, the, uh, the allies hired a psychologist to talk to, the, to these, I guess, well, I guess he's trying to figure out, there was, oh, you know, what motivated them to peer into their minds? What made them do these things? Never think of hiring a psychologist to look into your own mind, but look into their minds. And uh, so this psychologist uh, interviewed Goering, took notes, wrote, and then wrote a book about his interviews. And one of the things he asked Goering is, you know, how, how are the German people led into this war, which was so disastrous for them? And Goering said, oh, it's, it's simple, really. It's not a problem. He said, people don't really want to go to war. But you tell them that some terrible thing will happen to them if they don't go to war. You tell them that you're fighting against some evil. And, you know, just tell it to them enough of them, enough times, and they'll believe it, and, and you'll go to war. One of the things that happen in war, and this is what I began to think about as I thought about my own, my own trajectory from being a, a warrior, um, being a bombardier, to being anti-war, uh, I realized that what happens is that uh, if the other side is evil, which it often is, you assume then that your side must be good. It may not be so. The other side may be evil, and you might also be evil. Now maybe they're a little more evil. <laughs> but the point is that uh, you're not suddenly uh, blessed with purity because you fight, are fighting against something evil. It may be that the people on your side uh, are really not great. When you think about it, who fought against Hitler? <laughs> the British Empire, the French Empire, Stalin's Russia, the American Empire. Really, I mean, when you look at it that way, I know I'm calling names empires, but that's what they were. Uh, so you, you, you go through the psychological trick. They're bad, therefore we're good. Forgetting that war corrupts everybody. This is one conclusion thing. War corrupts everybody who engages in it. It doesn't matter. You go back to the Peloponnesian War, and they're the Spartans, and they're the bad guys. And they're the Athenians, and they're the good guys. You know, Athenian democracy and all of that. They get into the Peloponnesian War, and soon the Athenians are behaving like the Spartans. And that's what happened in World War II, and, and that's, you know, the nature of war. So, yeah, I have to look at some of these, uh, uh, some of the ideas that come out of the experience of war. One of the, one of the uh, things to get accustomed to is the idea that these people who run our country are not wiser than we are. There are a lot of people who think, and this is a very obsequious attitude in what is supposed to be a democracy, oh, we, who are we? Who are we to know these things? Those people up there in the White House, they know what they're doing. No, they don't know what they're doing. We've seen this again and again. And, oh, but they have experts around them. Yes, they have experts around them. They have experts with PhDs and Phi Beta Kappa keys. Kennedy had them, Johnson had them. They were called the best and the brightest. And they were engaged in the most stupid war that we had waged up to that time. We've tried to exceed it since then. But no, these people up on top are not necessarily smarter than you are. There's such a thing as common sense. Aside from facts and figures, which these, maybe these people up there know more facts and figures, at least their facts and figures, uh, but there's such a thing as common sense. You know, like when Bush was telling us to go to war in Iraq and, uh, uh, five, five years ago and talk about weapons of mass destruction. And we didn't really know, you know, do they really have weapons, you know, uh, or are well, they, they looking like they, Bush is telling us, the Cheney's telling us, the, the Condoleezza Rice is telling us mushroom cloud, working on a nuclear weapon. Common sense might have suggested, what if they do have weapons of mass destruction? What are they going to do with it? 
You mean Iraq is going to attack the United States? What do you think? Iraq is surrounded by enemies. You think it's Iraq is... What about this nuclear thing that they might be developing in five years? The United States has 10,000 nuclear weapons. So why are we excited? Is it possible that they're just trying to build up fear in us to get us to go to war? No, the, you, know, uh, you have to be very wary uh, of thinking you know, that these people uh, you know a lot and uh, you have to uh, you have to have some some faith yeah in in common sense and uh, I promised myself I would finish in seven minutes I'm a very precise person uh, and uh, so um, We have to stop wars. We have to stop this war, and we have to get out of the habit of war. We have to get, we have to get out of the. It's you know, it's more than a habit. It's an addiction, really. It's an, an addiction. You know, you have a problem, send the troops. <laughs> you have a problem, bomb them. You have to get out of that way of thinking. You have to get out of thinking that we must be a military superpower. We must get out of thinking that we must have military bases as we have in a hundred countries. Is it possible that having military bases in a hundred countries arouses a lot of antagonism? Is it possible that, that it provokes terrorism when your soldiers and your sailors are all over the world occupying this country and occupying, is that, is it possible? How come there are countries that don't worry about terrorism could it be because they're not bothering anybody? <laughs> Could it be that we're bothering too many people and too many countries? Shouldn't we stop thinking we have to be number one? Why should we be number one? And, no. Well, yeah. Let's be modest. Let's be number 12. <laughs> yeah. uh, why do we have to be a military superpower? Why can't it be a humanitarian superpower? No. Yeah. Instead of sending planes to bomb, why don't we send planes with food and medicine? No. So, well, in order to, in order to turn things around, you've got to create a social movement. That, you know, people in the White House are not going to do it. Even if you change the leadership in the White House, that won't do it. Whenever, here again, history comes in handy, whenever important things had to be done and, import, and injustices had to be rectified, that initiative did not come from Washington. It came from social movements. The anti, it was the anti-slavery movement more than Abraham Lincoln that was responsible for the end of slavery. It, you know, it was the... It was, the, it was the labor movement more than FDR that was responsible for the minimum wage and all of that. It was, uh, you know, it was the, uh, so we need a new social movement. We need more protests. We need more action. We need more citizen involvement. Yes, and we need civil disobedience. We need, we need dramatic actions. I mean, that's, in Vietnam, acts of civil disobedience were very important. It was very important when those priests and nuns and other people went into draft boards and broke the law or put on trial, you know, trespassing, breaking and entering. They weren't doing violence to people, but they were breaking the law. You mustn't break the law. Or oh, the president can break the law. <laughs> A thousand times he can break the law. You cannot break the law. That's civil is so. But, but breaking the law is important because it, it dramatizes your protest. That's what happened during the Vietnam War. There were many dramatic acts of civil disobedience which aroused people to think, think more about the war. And probably the most important acts of civil disobedience were the soldiers. The soldiers who came back from Vietnam and formed Vietnam Veterans Against the War, and they exposed atrocities to the public. And the soldiers who remained in Vietnam and would not go out on patrol, or the B-52 uh, bomber pilots who at a certain point said, I'm not going to go over and do any more bombing. Unlike McCain, who went over and bombed. When, don't, you know, I know McCain was a prisoner and he suffered torture and, and he 